March to Recovery. This is a record of people who have suffered an unprecedented disaster. In this episode, we visit the town of Miharu in Fukushima Prefecture. After the accident at the nuclear power plant, the town gave its citizens medication to protect them from radiation. Nestled in the foothills west of the Abukuma Mountains, Miharu is a small town with a population of 18,000. This castle town has flourished over the centuries since medieval times. The town is famous for its huge weeping cherry tree, said to be 1,000 years old. The tree stands 14 meters tall. Every spring, 300,000 people flock to it, hoping to be re-energized by its vitality. The most beautiful season of Miharu was about to begin when the earthquake struck. Miharu was shaken by intense tremors that destroyed roads and houses and threw the town into confusion. The disaster at the nuclear power plant 50 kilometers east of Miharu plunged the town into further chaos. Amidst the turmoil, Miharu obtained iodine tablets to protect its citizens from radiation. But official government authorization to administer the tablets was not forthcoming. We didn't trust that we were being given the information we really wanted. So the only choice we had was to try and protect the townspeople ourselves. With the residents' safety as its top priority, the town took matters into its own hands and instructed people to take the tablets. We work as nurses, and so we don't usually administer medication at our own initiative. So we knew that if anything happened and our actions were questioned, it could spell the end of our careers in public health and as midwives and nurses. Amid confusion and uncertain reports, the town gathered its own facts and encouraged its residents to take the medication. This is the story of their struggle to reach that decision. The day after the earthquake, Tokyo Electric Power Company's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was in a dire situation. At 5.44 a.m., the government ordered the evacuation of 50,000 citizens. The evacuation zone was expanded from 3 kilometers to 10 kilometers. At this point, a crucial evacuation route was the road stretching from the plant towards Miharu, Route 288. Vast numbers of residents from towns like Okuma, situated near the plant, headed over the Abukuma Mountains to Miharu. After March 12th, 
the town hall became the emergency response headquarters of Miharu. At the headquarters, support was being provided to residents affected by the disaster. Kuniharu Hashimoto, who was heading up the operation, received a call. It was a request for Miharu to take in evacuees. I got a call from the police on the morning of March 12th, saying that people were being evacuated and asking how many people Miharu could take in. We already had our hands full looking after the residents of Miharu. When I asked how many people, the police first said 700, and we felt we could handle them. So a few members of our staff started preparations. But in reality, 5,000 evacuees descended upon the town. Nine evacuation shelters took in 2,000 people, but that was the limit. That afternoon, a hydrogen explosion hit Reactor 1. It was plain to see that the crisis was worsening. The 10-kilometer evacuation zone that was supposedly an extra precaution was now widened to 20 kilometers. Meanwhile, town officials were making the rounds of the shelters dotted around Miharu. Chisato Takenouchi, a public health nurse, was giving advice to evacuees. From there to there, nearly 30 trucks from the self-defense forces were stretched all the way down. And there were also nearly 20 big tourist buses in the open space over there. The town's gymnasium was overflowing with people who had fled with only the clothes on their backs. Takenouchi went from one person to the next, listening to their health problems. A pregnant woman from a town near the power plant had a question about some tablets she had gotten hold of. It was the first time Takenouchi had ever seen these round tablets in their yellow packet. Neither I nor the other nurse on duty had ever seen these tablets, so we were asking, where did you get these? What were you told when you got them? She was told before leaving that it was iodine for the thyroid and to take it before being exposed to radiation. She'd been told it was up to her whether or not to take it, so she asked us what she should do. We couldn't answer then and there, so we asked her to wait until we went back and did some research, and she said that was okay. Takenouchi returned to the Public Health and Welfare Division and explained what had happened at the shelter. She consulted a veteran in the field, Division Director Hiroyuki Kudo. He was in charge of the townspeople's health management. She also asked public health nurse Miyoko Sakuma. Neither knew about the tablets. I simply didn't have a clue what it was, and even when I looked at its name, I was stumped. I didn't know anything about it, and so I needed to do some research to find out more. The next day, Kudo and his public health and welfare team began their research in earnest. The tablets were stable iodine, an important drug that can protect against exposure to radiation. Stable iodine tablets work in the following way. The radioactive iodine that is emitted in a nuclear accident tends to be absorbed by the thyroid located in the neck. This can lead to cancer. 
However, by taking non-radioactive stable iodine tablets beforehand, it is possible to block the radioactive iodine. On rare occasions, there are side effects. An allergy to iodine can cause a rash or a fever. The distribution of the tablets requires authorization from the national or prefectural government and the presence of a medical professional. The tricky part is when to take the tablets. When taken 24 hours before radiation exposure, the tablets have a 93% protective effect. But as time passes, their effectiveness diminishes. Taken 8 hours after exposure, they are 40% effective, and 24 hours after, it's down to just 7%. It's crucial that the tablets be taken at the right time. Takenouchi became aware of the invisible dangers of radiation for the first time. I read through some literature and I started getting really scared. I wondered if we were even actually safe here and thinking about my own exposure to radiation as well. I started getting really worried. It was then I realized for the first time the gravity of the situation. The results of the public health team's research were sent to the town's headquarters. The information was reported to Shigeru Fukaya, the head of the emergency response headquarters. He had never even thought about nuclear accidents before. In terms of understanding nuclear power, we just thought it was other people's business to know, those beyond the mountains, in the coastal region. That's what we thought at the time. That day, a town official arrived in Miharu from Okuma, where the power plant is situated. Jin Ishida dealt with disaster prevention in Okuma and was well versed in nuclear emergencies. Ishida had helped evacuate the Okuma residents, and seeing the reactor explode before his very eyes, he realized the full scale of the disaster. Reactor 1 exploded, and from just above the pine trees, brown or rather reddish-brown smoke shot up. Did you hear it? Yes, I did. What was it like? It just went boom. Fukaya was surprised at Ishida's extensive knowledge about nuclear emergencies. He decided to ask Ishida for advice on all aspects of nuclear disaster management. Ishida joined the team at the town hall headquarters and immediately set about surveying the contamination levels. He showed Fukaya and his team a simulation of the spread of radiation produced by Austrian researchers. They calculated the flow of the atmosphere and showed the direction the contaminants were spreading. What level of contaminants were coming and how were they spreading? Without these facts, there's no way of knowing how to protect the residents. I told them the situation. For example, the concentration is unknown, but it's possible a radiation plume may flow this way soon. Or a high concentration might be coming. We discussed these things looking at the simulation. Japan does in fact have its own diffusion prediction system called SPEEDY. The government developed it to calculate contamination accurately. But after the earthquake, power outages meant crucial data from emission sources were missing and contamination levels could not be calculated. The decision on whether to administer iodine depended on this system. The government had stumbled at the first hurdle. 
unable to obtain emission source data, the Nuclear Safety Technology Center made calculations using estimated figures after the accident occurred. On the 13th, radiation diffusion and concentration were estimated based on the assumption that one of the reactors was completely ruined. The outermost yellow line indicates the area where iodine consumption was required. Immediately after the disaster, the government produced diffusion forecasts based on various scenarios every day. But such data never reached Miharu. The diffusion of radiation and just how much the human body was being affected by this. These were the things we wanted to know about the most. This would determine how we'd instruct the townspeople and how we'd deal with the situation. So this was the most critical thing in this disaster. We did contact the prefecture to request the information we wanted. But unfortunately, the answer we got was, we don't know. At 11 a.m. on March 14th, a second hydrogen explosion occurred, this time in Reactor 3, throwing the plant into an even more critical situation. With no word from the prefecture, Fukaya set about gathering information himself. He decided to monitor wind direction using a streamer. This is where the wind streamer was installed. Plastic strips were attached to the end of a rod. I monitored wind direction by attaching a streamer at the end of a rod about four meters long. Where is the plant from here? That way. Beyond the PA speakers? That's right. While he installed the streamer on the rooftop himself, Fukaya instructed his staff to gather more information. We only had TV and the internet as news sources. I told my staff they must use imagination and resourcefulness in order to make decisions. And that's what we all set out to do. On the afternoon of the 14th, Takenouchi and her colleagues headed to Fukushima City to visit the prefectural government. They had found out that the prefecture had stocks of iodine. In addition to the existing stockpiles for the six towns surrounding the plant, the prefecture was procuring tablets that could be distributed. There was a room at the headquarters, and the corridor in front of it was filled with reporters and other people. Amidst the chaos, there were boxes of iodine tablets carelessly stacked. I was quite taken aback at the sight. Anyone could have just taken them. I told the person in charge how many we wanted, and they counted them out quite carelessly, and I wondered if this was okay. Takenouchi procured tablets for the 7,248 residents aged under 40 who needed to take the medication. She sought the advice of expert Ishida on when the tablets should be taken. He warned her that the next day, the 15th, would be the most dangerous day yet. He said if the plant was hit by further explosions, we will lose our hometown. I remember that very vividly. That was when it first hit me that our lives really were in danger. The wind direction and the timing of the easterly wind were key. He said he was just praying that the mountains would trap the radioactive contaminants. 
She kept a record of everything Ishida told her. Ishida seemed particularly concerned with the direction of the wind passing over the nuclear plant. The weather forecast predicted that the next day, the 15th, the wind direction would change after 3 p.m. to an easterly wind blowing from the plant. Furthermore, rain was also forecast from the afternoon. Rain, combined with the easterly wind, raised the possibility that hot spots of high radiation would develop. On the night of the 14th, with information that danger lay ahead the next day, the town's disaster response headquarters called an emergency meeting. On the agenda, the distribution of iodine tablets. Twelve division directors were assembled for the meeting. To understand what ordinary citizens might think, the meeting called upon those who knew little about iodine tablets to air their views. They were quick to voice their concerns. The power plant had exploded. So I was aware that radioactivity was likely to be leaking. But at that point, we still hadn't heard from the government, the power company, or the media. There had been no contact, no reports. I felt we should ascertain the radiation levels and make our own decision. If we were to hand out the tablets, it would give the impression that the situation in Miharu was already as bad as in the areas near the plant. The townspeople would think that was what we were effectively telling them. That was the more immediate concern for me. In an abnormal situation never faced before, no one could give a clear answer. They just had to search for the best solution. After the 11th, it wasn't feasible to conduct discussions with the prefecture like we usually do. And in a way, as the prefecture had given us the tablets, to distribute them without their authorization was unavoidable in such an emergency. We could hand out the tablets without instructions to take them and find out radiation levels were high. Or we could ask people to take them just in case and realize levels weren't high after all, which would have more serious consequences. We thought there was a greater risk of being exposed to high levels and realizing too late to do anything about it. And so we should hand them out. It was after 11 at night when the mayor was informed of the meeting's conclusion to distribute the tablets as quickly as possible. The public health nurses had found in their research that there were some known side effects. But they weren't life-threatening, and so we decided to go ahead. If that was the conclusion of the director's meeting, we should do it. Whatever happened, we were prepared to assume full responsibility. And that was what we decided. At the same time, preparations for the distribution were already underway. The Public Health and Welfare Division had organized the listing up of the 7,000 townspeople who were to be given the drug. They also enlisted the help of 30 town hall staff to label the envelopes. They divided up the tablets into envelopes for each household according to the number of people and their age. Before distribution, 
the public health nurses faced a difficult decision. This is the government-issued manual regarding iodine administration. It requires the presence of a medical professional when distributing the tablets. It was decided doctors would focus on dealing with victims of the disaster, and the distribution of iodine tablets would be handled by public health nurses. This is basically a powerful drug, and medication can only be given out and administered with a doctor's prescription. We work as nurses, and so we don't usually administer medication at our own initiative. So we knew that if anything happened and our actions were questioned, it could spell the end of our careers in public health and as midwives and nurses. Around 6 a.m. on March 15th, two of the plant's reactor buildings suffered explosions. There was concern that the containment vessel of Reactor 2 had been ruptured. This would lead to particularly high levels of contamination. At this time, the wind in the plant vicinity was blowing toward the south. Word of the extensive spread of the contamination first reached Miharu through the early morning news on TV. According to the report, significant radiation contamination had already reached Ibaraki, 1.5 times farther from the plant than Miharu. At 8 a.m., as soon as the mayor arrived, the town made its decision on iodine distribution. It was predicted the northerly wind would turn southerly and then easterly, and we'd get rain or sleet here by the afternoon of the 15th. So we knew the danger of a radiation plume being hit by the rain would be greatest that afternoon. Given the situation with reactors 2 and 4 that morning, we were convinced that the timing had become critical. So we informed the mayor, as soon as he arrived, that we thought today would be the right time to administer the tablets. That was what we told him. With the meltdown of reactor 2, radiation levels in the area rose. At 11 a.m., the government instructed those living within a 30-kilometer radius to stay indoors. On the roof of the town hall, Fukaya's windstreamer could not take accurate recordings as intended, since the surrounding hills affected the course of the wind. Hoping to find a more suitable location, Fukaya consulted Kazuyasu Honda, the town council chairman, who had a good knowledge of the eastern approaches of town. Honda suggested a hill in the northern part of Miharu. It was open to the east, which would allow the flow of the wind to be monitored. There was a spa at the top of the hill, where there was no danger of the forests blocking the wind. Working at the spa and volunteering in a soup kitchen there since the day after the earthquake was Honda's daughter, Chihara. After receiving the request by phone, Chihara headed to the storage shed. She found a two-meter-long flagpole and some plastic strips. The wind streamer she made at the time is still here. 
When she installed it on this tree, there was a strong wind blowing. Which direction was the wind blowing when you took the photo? From there to here. And so the plastic strips attached at the top were blowing directly to the left. The wind was blowing from the direction of the nuclear plant, confirming their worst fears. Chiharu took the photo to the town hall. Giving out the iodine was a brave move because it was unprecedented. So I knew we needed some proof that the wind was blowing this way in the form of a photo that could be taken and brought here to keep as data. Which was why I asked her to take the photo. To educate the residents about the iodine, the town enlisted the help of the board members of its seven residents' associations. It was the first time the drug was being distributed in a town beyond the immediate vicinity of the nuclear plant. People over 40 had to be informed that they did not need to take the tablets, while children required low doses. The residents' associations were enlisted to inform people of the effects of the iodine tablets and the possibility of radiation contamination. The town produced its own leaflet about taking iodine. It listed in detail the target age groups, those who shouldn't take tablets, and other precautions. Instructions for taking the drug were to be explained when the tablets were given out. The emergency PA system was also utilized to make sure the message got through. Each household in Miharu is equipped with a wireless receiver. The instruction to take the tablets as soon as they were received was broadcast repeatedly. Instead of just relying on TV or the internet, town officials did their own research before deciding to administer the iodine. At 1 p.m., three days after first seeing the tablets, they began handing them out. This is a photo from that day. Under the supervision of nurses, eight distribution centers were set up around the town. It was a decision that prioritized the residents' safety over everything else. Everyone looked more nervous than usual, and there were lots of questions like, is it really better to take the tablets? And you answered? Please make sure you take them. I told them, of course they're not a miracle pill, but they limit the absorption of iodine, so it was important to take them, especially children. Most of the residents took the drug immediately. In this household with a four-year-old boy, the family discussed whether now was the best timing before deciding to take the tablets. To manage to hand out the tablets amidst all that confusion, they had to do so much in such short time. I didn't think they would go out of their way to endanger the townspeople at such a difficult time. The town was much closer to our daily lives than the national government. And I trust the people who run the town, so that's why I decided to take the tablets. But I wouldn't want anyone else to have to go through what we did. Around 5 p.m., the distribution of the tablets was nearly complete. 
Kudo, the director of public health, received a call from a prefectural government official. He asked on whose authority we were acting, and I told him the town was taking responsibility to act under the mayor's direction. He said we needed prior authorization from the government or the prefecture's disaster headquarters, and the tablets were to be distributed under the supervision of a doctor. So what were we doing? The government's decision-making was a mess. He said we needed a doctor, but if you read carefully, it says you need medical professionals at each evacuation center and not necessarily doctors. I pointed this out to him and challenged what he said. He said in a forceful tone, I order you to recall the tablets. He was an official from the Regional Medical Affairs Division. I argued that he needed the authority of the governor to give out such an order. And he said, as it's an emergency situation, I'm assuming the responsibility of ordering the recall of the tablets. So I said, I can't follow your order then. We argued back and forth, recall them, no we can't. Finally he said, recall them one last time and hung up. So we just carried on with our plan. The distribution ended at 6 p.m. In the end, 95% of the 3,303 households received the tablets. As forecast, it began raining that afternoon. There were some residents who decided against taking the tablets. When discussing it with her three daughters, this mother was told by her eldest college-age daughter that she didn't want to take them. She said, I'm not taking them because there's a risk of side effects. I couldn't force her to take them. Then the middle child said she wouldn't take them either. Then I began to wonder, was it right to make only the youngest take them? We decided not to take them immediately, and we just kept them for the time being. Now, when I think about it, I really regret it. You regret it? Yes. The town distributed the tablets at that time, and they really should have been taken immediately. After reading and hearing more information later on, I realized that was the right timing. As a parent, the fact that I didn't have them take the tablets right away is something I really regret. Since I realized that, I've been looking for ways to prevent any further radiation exposure. After distributing the iodine tablets, the town recorded two cases of side effects, neither of them serious. In May 2012, 14 months after the nuclear accident, Tokyo Electric Power Company released radioactive emission figures for the first time. According to this document, the emission figures for radioactive iodine-131 spiked at one point in time. Out of a total 500 petabecquerels, 200 petabecquerels were released at this time. The contamination was concentrated on March 15th and 16th. This was precisely when the iodine tablets taken by the Miharu residents were most effective.
in terms of what we were being told by the government or the powers that be, we didn't trust that we were being given the information we really wanted. So the only choice we had was to try and protect the townspeople ourselves. That was the priority we chose. If we had waited for instructions from the government, it would have been too late for the 15th. It turned out that was perfect timing. I felt at the time this was the best option. There was no information from the prefecture or the government to help us with the decision. Deep down, I felt no one could say we were wrong, that no one could blame us. This is a simulation of the spread of radioactive material created after the fact. The wind blowing to the south on the morning of the 15th passed north of Miharu in the afternoon, leaving a significant trace in the Itate area. In the end, the contamination in Miharu was deemed lower than the government threshold for administering iodine. With the wind direction and the timing of the rain that day, I still feel it could have been us. It was just by chance. That's what I think. It was just by chance that Itate was hit by rain, and it just happened to be that time of day. Depending on the movement of the wind and the rain, it could have been us or any other town or village. It was just a matter of luck, although luck might be an inappropriate word, but I think that's what it boils down to. For the sake of the residents, the town of Miharu considered what it could do with the power it had and swiftly took action. When disaster strikes out of nowhere and amidst conflicting information, what can we believe and how should we act? These are questions with no simple answers.